Good evening. I'm Ivis Williams. I'm your chair uh, this evening. Uh, welcome to the organisation and community scrutiny panel. Please be advised that this meeting will be recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel. Can all those speaking ensure you switch on your microphones before addressing the meeting and remember to switch it off when you have finished speaking. Members may have noticed in the new scrutiny report template, which makes it clear that we as a scrutiny panel can make recommendations to the executive on any of the items being considered today. Please also note that any recommendation will be published as an appendices, appendix to the report and that the response from the director and the cabinet member will be, respond, will be brought back to the next meeting of the panel. Item number one, apologies for absence. I've received apologies from Councillor Matt Hartley, who replaces Councillor Pat Greenwell. I've received apologies from Councillor Lakshin Southern. Are there any other apologies? I see none. Item number two, urgent business. There are no uh, urgent business. Number th item number three, declaration of interest. Does any member have any personal or financial interest that they wish to declare? I see none, thank you. Item number four, the minutes of the last meeting. Are members happy to agree the, me the minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of July? Agreed. Item number five, we will have the legal services update. Um, uh, as I've said before, that members can make recommendations and these recommendations will be, um, uh, the response to the recommendation will be uh, re carried back on to the next meeting. So may I invite uh, Azuka Unra, the Interim Directorate, Director for the Legal and Democratic Services, and Emma Newby, the Head of Democratic Services and Legal Practice Manager. It's a mouthful. Uh, thank you. Um, please present your report. Um, uh, join out the main points, um, specifically any updates in the last, uh, I think the report was held in May, back in May, so any up updates since then will be um, helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, you're quite right, we last came before this panel in, in May, and then we did a verbal update um, in, in July. So this focuses really very much on the period since April to, to bring things up to date. Um, if I can just refer you to paragraph 4.13 of the report, and there's a reference there to, um, we were working on providing more up-to-date and current information, and hopefully that's been made available to you either by email, but um, also I think there are hard copies available for you to um, refer to. And that breaks down um, performance and service needs issues um, by reference to the individual teams within legal services. But I'll, I'll get to that. Um, Emma Newby is, is apart from um, democratic services, um, she's also the practice manager for um, legal services and was instrumental in, in um, putting together um, our operational partnership agreement. So if, if you think it's appropriate, I'd also ask her to just take you through some of the highlights of, of that agreement, because I think it, it does answer some of the questions around KPIs and, and performance and, and demand, et cetera. So if I can just start off then. So um, paragraph 4.2, um, just basically sets out the, the background um, and, and sets out the narrative that legal services comprises 49 established posts, and that's a mix between um, fee earners, so lawyers, assistant lawyers, etc., and the um, admin support um, to the lawyers um, in this team. Um, and it, it's, it lists the, the various teams um, in the bullet points that you can see there at 4.2. 4.3 reflects the fact that we operate a mixed economy. And whilst our aspiration um, is that work is carried out um, in-house, um, there, there is a recognition and a general acceptance that sometimes work can't be carried out in-house. 
either because of capacity or because of knowledge and skills. And therefore, we do um, um, outsource some work to external providers, um, external firms of solicitors or barristers. Um, we also do supplement our, our workforce by the use of, of locum solicitors. And we'll touch on that later on when we're talking about the, some of the pressures in terms of recruitment. <clears throat> so 4.3 basically elaborates um, on that, as does 4.4. Four point five then talks about um, continuing um, general overall demand across legal services, and I think I can summarise that by saying that when we came before this panel in May, um, we reflected on the fact that um, demand in certain areas um, continued to increase, and in some specific areas, the increase was unexpected. Um, so, for example, in terms of, of disrepair. Um, there's been a substantial increase over the last two years. Um, we're not alone in that. Um, we're in exactly the same position as um, other local authorities in, in that respect. In addition, um, we have had challenges in terms of recruitment, particularly um, for planning um, and for contract lawyers. And interestingly enough, um, <laughs> I think possibly because of the spike in disrepair across the board, also um, for planning, um, sorry, for um, housing lawyers, which is not something we've experienced um, before. So, para 4.6 onwards then deals with um, the issues that were set out in the commissioned brief. Um, and um, it talks about overall performance, including our key performance indicators and, and spend. Um, so the target hour for the target for legal work is approximately forty thousand hours across the board, um, and and that's consistent with the um, industry um, established average. Each fee earner um, has a daily average in terms of a chargeable target, um, and we monitor that through our case management um, system. In addition. Simply because of demand, we do have additional posts, um, temporary posts, um, that we established um, in the service in 2022-23 and ongoing um, to cover um, staffing gaps. However, even with those um, temporary posts, there's still an overachievement. Um, in fact, you know, the service is recording much more than 40,000 hours um, um, per annum. It's about 15% over um, that 40,000. More so in some areas, and I've mentioned in, in, in disrepair, um, and also to a certain extent in, in um, contracts as well. Obviously, legal is there to provide support to the um, council's um, procurement um, um, activities. And as you'd expect, it's, it's a, a very challenging um, area uh, um, for local government at the moment. So in 2023, 22, 23, we opened 2,700 new matters. So that's across the board, um, in, across all of the teams. Um, um, to date, for 24, 25, um, we're already at 2,031. So in the first six months, we've opened 2,031 matters compared to 2,700 the, the year before. Um, those are individual cases. In addition, there's the ongoing advice and support to directorates, um, and which is not always accurately um, recorded just because of the nature of ad hoc um, advice and support that's provided. But one area where we, we do, where we maintain very, very accurate records are in relation to the number of uh, committee reports um, that we provide legal comments and legal support for. And you can see that um, for 23-24, um, we, we processed 653 um, reports. And since the 1st of April this year, 
um, to date we're at 401. So significant increases um, um, is obvious. I mean, the, the providing support to reports is a crucial part of our work. It's a crucial part of the council's decision-making process um, because it's, it's our role to ensure that the decisions that are made are legally robust and legally sound. And that's, that, that's part and parcel of, of what we do. Um, it's part of our, our business as usual. Um, and it's, it's, it's one example of, of er, an area where we can't control the demand because the demand is driven by what's going on in, in the services across the council in terms of the decisions that they're requiring to make in order to, de to deliver the services that they need to, de to deliver. One of the questions we were asked um, in the summer <clears throat> was about um, our KPIs. Um, and I mentioned at the time that we were working on, we, we were referring to it as a several le uh, le service level agreement at the time, but it's uh, it developed into an operational partnership agreement, which is, is really important because it reflects the partnership arrangement and the partnership approach that we take to working with um, other directorates. So we've concluded that and we launched it on the 1st of October and that's at um, Appendix B um, of the report. And Emma, uh, as I said, is, is on hand to, to take you through that. But what it does do is it sets out um, the services that are provided um, by legal services, the standards of performance that can be expected, the cost of delivering those um, services, and because it is a, a, a collaborative partnership agreement, the other side of it is it sets out what can be expected from the directorates in return in terms of the quality of instructions and, and general ways of working. Because it was only launched on the 1st of October, we're at a very early um, stage, but we are expecting, and, and maybe when we report back next time, but we are expecting um, it to drive down um, demand in, in certain area because there are certain things that we're now requiring um, clients, um, departments to do. Um, also in terms of demand, um, the, the, the more um, up to date and up to speed um, your, the client departments are, that reduces the, the kind of routine kind of queries that we're, we're encountering. So that's all hand in hand as part of the um, operational framework agreement. Um, the KPIs will of course be kept under review and we'll um, report back to you um, on that um, in due course. Running alongside that is also our annual um, um, survey of of directorates, um, which we had launched earlier on in the year. It's an annual survey. So when we last came, um, it was ongoing. And we had hoped that we'd have concluded it by now. But unfortunately, um, we didn't get as, as good a response as we had hoped. So we relaunched it and we're pushing it back out to the departments and hoping to be able to um, report to you on that in due course. But just from looking at the previous survey, um, you'll see we'll, we can say that 94% of respondents rated our, our service as satisfactory or above, um, with over two thirds um, giving us a rating of um, good or excellent. Of course, outside of the annual survey, um, we do monitor um, performance. Um, we regularly engage with our client, um, client departments. Um, and I'm pleased to say that those liaison meetings haven't highlighted any major areas of, of concern in terms of our performance and, and, and delivery of services. Um, I'm happy to stop here if you'd like, Emma, to take you through just the highlights of the operational um, partnership agreement um, before I go on to the MTS savings, if, if you'd like that, Chair. Thank you. So in terms of the operational partnership agreement, it's appended, as Zuka said, uh, at B. 
um, and it's set out into sections, including uh, the, the, the objectives, um, the collaborative principles, and the key contacts for the lead partners within legal services. Uh, service commitments are set out in Schedule 1, and there's some specific uh, targets around performance and response times. Uh, user commitments are set out in Schedule 2, um, and there are some specific asks of how instructions come to legal services to streamline and ensure that we are efficient um, across all of the directorates. Section 3, uh, Schedule 3 sets out the KPIs, and I'll, I'll just highlight those in, in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, and there are a vision of our KPIs. Section 4 sets out the work areas, so what's undertaken by legal services, and that is supplemented by uh, a legal menu um, for transparency to the directors of what we're able to provide. Um, there's also a Schedule 5 in terms of how the, the, the charges are structured for legal services, and Schedule 6 sets out any uh, procedures for complaints and issues. Um, so in terms of the KPIs um, that are set out in Section 3, the highlights are that we measure the recorded billable hours as against targets for lawyers. Um, we measure the completion of matters within 12 months, and the target for that is 60%. Um, we monitor the number of cases opened and closed, and those were highlighted as part of the report um, that Zuka has introduced. Um, we provide... Uh, we seek to provide advice within 10 working days or by other agreement. Um, decision reports, um, comments will be received within five working days of, uh, of receipt of the complete report. Um, and the 90% client satisfaction or above in the annual legal survey. There are also, as part of that section, some more specific delivery targets um, set out. The agreement was operational from the 1st of October, and this is available for all, for all directorates to see, along with the appendices. Um, can I just check with members? Are members happy to pause there, or do you want Azuka to carry on to the end and then come in with questions? If oh, Okay, Azuka, yeah. Thank you, Chair. So, um, continuing then, um, power of 4.11 um, identifies areas of efficiency and savings, and we focused on um, legal services MTFS proposals, of which there are three. The first one is the redesign of the service level agreement between legal services and, and the schools. Um, to ensure that, um, as an organization, we're providing services on a cost recovery basis. Um, and that will generate approximately £50,000 per annum um, from schools for 24-25. Um, most of, well, 90% of the schools have signed up um, to, to the SLA. It's not compulsory that they all, all sign up. But I think it's a reflection of, of you know, how the schools view um, our service that 90% of them um, have signed up. Um, the, the second MTFS proposal was to reduce spend on council um, in relation to safeguarding children proceedings. So we tend to use council across legal services um, to take matters to court not your routine day-to-day -day kind of matters um, that go to court, but slightly more complex or contentious issues or matters um, that are going before the high court where we don't all, all have um, rights of audience. But in terms of safeguarding children, just the nature of the work has tended to m mean that there's a higher need to um, have advocacy hearings um, and, and appearances before the court during the process of usually child protection um, and care proceedings. So the proposal is that rather than using um, barristers chambers routinely for those cases, um, we have reduced the, num the reliance on council's chambers so that we do the advocacy at initial hearings um, in the house. And that's, pro that's pro projected to result in a £37,500 a year um, efficiency saving. 
And then the third one relates to our recharge um, rate for work done um, in terms of the regeneration work that the council is doing. Um, and that's where we do um, legal work um, and the developer is contractually obliged to pay um, the council for, for, for the legal aspect of the work. Um, and originally the rate was um, £105 per hour um, and that's now been increased to 220. I apologize, there's a typo in the report. It says 230, but it's actually 220. Um, and that's for um, 2324. And this is on the basis of a full cost recovery. And it's very much in line with um, arrangements for um, planning agreements. And we've done some benchmarking and we can confirm that that's consistent with, with what other borrowers um, how other boroughs approach it and charge. And that's projected to um, result in about 120,000 um, per annum. Um, but we need, do need to bear in mind that demand for regeneration work does um, fluctuate. In terms of all three of the proposals, we are um, on target as we, um, th there are slight dips and peaks and dips as, as you would expect, but we're confident that we will um, reach um, those targets um, or be very, very close, close to those targets. Paragraph 4.12 then um, looks at skills and competencies in legal services. And we were asked to reflect on the use of skills and competency matrix in legal services to identify um, gaps and opportunities like T levels. Um, we don't use those matrix um, within legal services because it's not appropriate given the, the nature of the work that, that we do do. But, but I'm hoping it's clear that we do have um, a clear um, and consistent approach to development of our, our in-house staff. Um, and that's also set out in our workforce strategy, which we um, talked about when, when I was last here. Um, we have five um, apprenticeship opportunities currently, um, five secondment opportunities um, currently un underway, and seven honoraria um, opportunities. We very much um, believe in growing our own. That way we keep the, the skills and the knowledge um, in-house for the benefit of, of the council. And the approach that we're adopting um, is, is very much starting to bear, bear fruit. And then lastly, paragraph um, 4.3 is um, just reflecting on service demand and how we're responding to, to challenges. And we've set that out in the paper that's been sent to you um, separately. Um, taken the opportunity just to highlight some of the achievements across um, the various teams um, within legal services. And uh, I'll, I'll leave you to, to read those if, if you wish. Um, but I just want to focus on paragraph seven onwards. Um, so I've already mentioned the um, pressures in terms of demand um, and the challenges we have in terms of recruitment. Um, highlighted there that the spikes in demand are across legal services, but most acute in safeguarding um, adults, um, safeguarding children and safeguarding, um, sorry, um, housing disrepair. Um, we have our workforce strategy, um, which is, is consistent with um, um, the corporate um, strategy. Um, we have had some successes um, with re recruitment, but the market in these areas is very, very challenging. Um, and but but we're not we're not alone. We've done a great deal of work. Um, we've looked at lo um, local retention and recruitment issues. We've benchmarked salaries, and, and as, I said, as I said, we've um, um, aligning our strategy to the corporate strategy. The steps that we've taken um, in year have resulted in a reduction of our spend on agency staff by forty percent. 
So we've managed using our um, corporate strategy combined with our own approach um, has resulted in us being able to convert um, a number of long-term locums onto fixed-term um, contracts from the council, thereby reducing the spend. Um, the spend on locums is significantly higher than the, um, our salary um, costs. And, and that's something that we're going to be continuing. Um, we're looking to recruit, um, well, this, this is the second, third round of attempted recruitment for both the planning and um, contract side of, of the, the service. Um, but where we've applied um, certain um, incentives, we're hoping that that will um, improve our chances of recruiting to, um, to those posts, which are a key um, to the work that the council is doing, particularly given its planning and procurement. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, and if, if happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much, um, Azuka and Emma. Uh, I think it's with the information we've received, it's actually quite good to see the, uh, to get an update. Um, so I just want to thank you. I've got, before I open up for questions, I've got one question on the OPAs. Um, I know you mentioned that it's collaborative working, but I just wanted to uh, find out from you, Emma, in terms of the feeding uh, from the directorate. Because um, uh, I'm assuming being a partnership agreement is a two-way thing. So just want to understand from you their buy-in and um, were you able, did you have to do some negotiation in between um, departments to reach some uh, reliable uh, what response time? Because I know there's demand on your time. So the work's been undertaken since March um, and very, very much collaboratively with other directorates, um, particularly in designing the legal menu that's appended to it, setting out the works. We carefully consulted each directorate um, at DMTs um, and there was some significant input from GMT into the uh, feedback of, uh, that shaped the final version. I hope that answers your question, Chair. Thank you. I just want to make sure it wasn't a one-way thing, uh, so that's good to know. Azuka, you wanted to add? Just, just to add that going forward, built into the um, OPA is um, client liaison, departmental liaison. So that, that will um, build on that initial collaborative approach to its development, but, but its success is going to be very much dependent on us maintaining that contact. So it, there is embedded the client departmental liaison um, meetings, and that's an opportunity to, to d you know, do some horizon scanning and firefight and deal with specific issues. And, and you know, so it's not that it's something that's imposed. Um, certainly, we don't want it to be that way, and, and so we're, we're you know, open to, to seeing how it develops. I um, just want to open the, for the, to the floor for questions. Have members, do you have any question on any part of the report? I don't, Kathy. thank you. It was a really, really good, I read it earlier and I, I was desperately trying to think of some questions, but I couldn't, to be honest, because it's all covered. I mean, just, just quickly, what percentage of your staff are now agency staff. So I know you've had a really good result in getting people on board, but how many do you think you've got remaining? I think there's been a reduction to approximately 12% of staff of agency. Thank you. Sorry, I'm going to um, push a little bit. I didn't want to, some of these are in the pack, but I just wanted to challenge you on the establishment roles. Because um, I do, from reading the report, I can see that the demand is quite high. The um, business um, focus has changed. We've got the transport strategy, which require quite a lot of resources. Um, so I just wanted to ask you in terms of your team and reviewing of, um, uh, Steph is here, she'll correct me, of the establishment list. Do you think 49 is reasonable? Because you've got 49, that's 40,000 hours um, to get from that 49 establishment role. Um, 
you, you, you had to draw on some other resources, uh, temporary staff, agencies, etc. Do you think 49 is reasonable? Does that need to be reviewed? Uh, is that something you're looking at um, in terms of, uh, I don't know if the term rethinking legal services is, is appropriate. So just want to understand from your, honestly, uh, Steph is here, hopefully she'll listen and take away. Is 49 reasonable as an establishment post within the department? It's that, that 49 is both fee earners and, and admin support staff and the admin team is approximately nine approximately nine but in terms of the, the, the is is 49 enough with the current demand um, we're overachieving by 15 percent and that's it's probably more um, at the moment um, but it is something that we're keeping under constant review and we'll keep under um, review as part of our workforce strategy because you know the the, the model that best serves um, the organization is is an in-house um, service that's well resourced and, and with the appropriate skills um, spread across. There will be areas, inevitably there'll be areas where we might need to outsource for specialist technical um, support, but, but the, the model would be um, in-house. So the short answer is um, currently not because we're overachieving and it's something that we're going to be keeping under constant review. Joe. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for this report. It's really clear, and there's lots of information in it. I'm really impressed. Thank you. I've got one small, quite specific question. Shall I do that? Let me do that one first. And that was in the OPA, and I just want to make a suggestion. I think it was page 54. Um, it's talking about increasing um, the use of technology. And I would just like to put in a suggestion that that says the efficient, effective, and appropriate use of technology. It's, it's one of my things that uh, technology in itself doesn't always do what you want it to do. So there's no need for it if it don't work, <laughs> and there is a need if it does. Um, and I'd really love to see that whenever we talk about that kind of thing. The other stuff, I'm just sort of, trying to read behind some of the words here, and it, 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 it's a little bit to do with some of the questions that the chair's just asked. And I'm looking at the OPA and the stuff about the mutual respect. I'm looking at the annual survey and the low um, response so far. I'm thinking about the huge demands on the service and the fact that these aren't always going to be, um, you, you, there's no control over them. I mean, I'm, for instance, the repair stuff. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm on the board of a housing association and they're suffering exactly the same stuff. There's a load of uh, solicitors out there who are frankly ambulance chasing on this. Um, so this stuff is gonna happen. Yeah, demand can't be controlled, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. And I can see that you're working on everything you can to control as well as possible. And I'm asking, I guess, what the morale is like with the staff having to deal with these difficulties over achieving by that 15%. I did some sums about how many build hours that was when I thought it was 49. Now it's 40, of course, that's gone up and that's going to be at least four day, solid days of their week, let alone any training or staff meetings or whatever else they're doing. Um, and, you know, I've got uh, staff stuff in my mind because we'll be talking about that later. So, also, I'm also aware that sometimes legal advice, you're telling people things they don't want to hear. And, I, th I think that needs to be that needs to be up front. People need to know that, and that must be difficult too for the staff. So, tell me a little bit about the, the human side of what it's like in there, and if there's anything we can recommend that could help. 
Thank you. Um, I'll start with the last one. Um, I think that um, legal advice is, is there to support the organization and to you know, try and achieve what the organization is set out um, to achieve. And because of the nature of the organization, there is a, a recognition that sometimes you do have to say no um, on, on legal grounds. Um, and there is a general understanding that that advice is coming from a good place, which is a place of protecting us um, as an organization. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, that, it, that there isn't scope for challenge. Um, you know, you might give some advice and somebody says, well, have you thought of this? And, you know, and, and it's good to be challenged at times. But, but the, the basic principle is that the advice, whether it's positive or negative, is there to, to protect the organization. And, and that's the basis on which it's, it's received. Um, and I think a lot of that is to do with the kind of the collaborative mutual respect relationship um, um, across the board. In terms of, of morale, um, I think that morale is, is good. Um, it's certainly improving because the, the fruits of some of the work that we've been doing and the work that Emma's um, been doing in terms of um, bringing on locums um, onto um, fixed term contract to stop that constant turnover of, of, of locum staff, I think we're starting to see the fruits of, of that um, those strategies. Um, we are getting um, support from, so just as an example, I talked about disrepair. Um, the asset management colleagues recognize that um, in order for us to be able to keep on top of that work, they need to provide us with assistance. So they've facilitated us being able to recruit um, two lawyers on fixed term um, contracts and um, a legal assistant to, to help support. So I think that also supports morale as well. So it's not, you know, we're not alone in this. You know, clients are recognizing th th what's going on there and they're doing what they um, can do to, to help. Um, I think it, I mentioned previously our, our vision and values. Um, when we last met, and I think it, it's it's kind of Im embedded in there that you know nobody should um, not quite suffer in silence, but you know let's let's be open because that's the only way we're going to find um, a solution. And it might not be an, it, an, a perfect solution or the one that you're looking for, but there will be a solution to take pressures um, off from staff, and and. I think part of that is also um, having client departments on board and recognizing um, the, the demands. And uh, absolutely, there is a recognition across the organization that, you know, it's, it, it's like a funnel. We're at the end of a funnel. Um, and therefore, that's bound to have an, an impact. And that makes discussions about um, what we can do in terms of demand um, easier to have. So as an example, um, if we can train social workers in, in the adults team, just as an example, to do certain functions, that t alleviates some of the pressures um, on legal services. So, so there's real buy-in into, into that kind of approach. Um, you're, you're right, we, we can't control um, demand in the sense of turn on and turn off the, the tap, but there are things that we can do to try and kind of mitigate um, the, the, the demands and the impact. But I do think the main thing that's um, affecting staff morale is that the, 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 they're seeing now the results of, of some of the initiatives that we perhaps have talked about for a long time. And these things do take time to, um, to filter through. But I think we're starting to see um, the, the results of what we've been doing for the last year, two years. Is, is there anything? I think, Emma, if you'd like to add anything else. Yeah, just to add, um, a, an important point, really, is that there was consultation of the legal services staff as well in terms of the operation partnership agreement, and it was something that staff really welcomed to have that level of transparency, and, and I think there's been um, absolute buy-in to, to the principles set out in, in the 
a partnership agreement and I think that, that um, you know, this has led to probably an increase in, in staff morale. Thank you very much. Um, if I just go back to the survey, um, just to clarify something. So the last, the current survey is still out. It's been reopened because the response rate is low. Um, the previous survey did say that we've got 94% uh, positive response, or 94% of the response were um, uh, favorable. Um, how many were that compared, because 94 uh, is not a comparative figure to the nine, so I just want to know how many responses were received in the prior year, why nine would be deemed as a low response? Um, I don't know how that filters, filters through, but I'm happy to um, come back to you and let you know what that figure represents. Fine. Any other question? Any other question? No. Um, one final one, which I think is a crossover. So maybe Stephanie will be able to address it when she gets here. It's regarding the, um, in terms of the legal team. Uh, you did mention in there the litigate, the tribunal cases, the employment matters. Um, so I just want to know how you're working with the. Uh, HR, with HR colleagues um, to effectively address these and also to try uh, to reduce these, maybe some lessons learned or what um, support you're giving to the team? I think this is an example of a, a really good um, collaborative approach to dealing with these cases. Um, legal services and HR work closely, very closely together. Um, generally in terms of HR advice and more specifically in relation to any proceedings that are going towards a tribunal. In terms of any tribunal cases, we have an established um, procedure which sets out clearly roles and responsibilities and timelines and timescales and, and who does what, why and, and when. Um, but generally um, speaking, um, HR colleagues and legal colleagues um, will all... It, it's interesting, if you recall perhaps two years ago that we were all part of the same directorate, um, well, with the same director. Um, so that helped to, to develop that kind of close working. That's no longer the case, but I don't think that that has affected the closeness of, of the working relationships. Um, lessons learned, we regularly sit down um, as colleagues and debrief and look at you know outcomes from um, tribunals and, and the lessons that we've learned and how how we can apply those to um, previous uh, to future cases um, we're instrumental in um, providing support to um, policy hr policies um, and developments because quite often that that's the starting point to to, to so many things um, so I think in a, in a, in a nutshell, we, we work very well um, together. Thank you, Councillor Asley. Following on from that, do you use the same sort of like principle for um, tribunals and judicial um, cases where SEN is concerned? Um, because you're currently, and I noticed that you outsource the the cases um, to outside legal um, teams and given the fact that demand is so high for SEN and it's growing year by year and I'm one of the, in, in history, I'm one of the parents who's gone down that route with RBG a long time ago and the, six, the success rate and when it goes to tribunals, parents often win the cases, not the local authorities. That's quite high. So is it cost effective? Is it, is it worth uh, you know, um, taking some of those cases to court? It's difficult to generalize because each case will turn on its um, individual merits. Um, but in terms of the outsourcing, it, it's a situation we're in because um, we just simply can't get 
the level of expertise in-house. Um, but the, the firms that we outsource the work to um, are, are on the framework, so they've been procured through the um, LBLA. Um, and so we're, we're guaranteed that they represent value for money, um, knowledge and skills and all, all of those things. And as, as an organization, the fact that the work is outsourced doesn't mean that, that they get any less of a, a hands-on um, service because although the work is outsourced, central to, to, to how that matter progresses is still the in-house in team monitoring um, the performance, monitoring the work, liaising with the client department and the external solicitors, and basically making sure that there is a joined up um, approach. Because I think one of the things you, you can't replicate um, with it, the external um, solicitors is the understanding of the internal culture of the organization that an in-house lawyer um, brings. So the fact that we're outsourcing, we, we work very hard to make sure that, that that input isn't lost as a result. Um, in terms of um, should, should we be defending those, some of those cases, I mean, it's, it's obviously for each in, individual um, whether or not they want to bring um, proceedings. But before we make a decision on, on whether or not to defend something, we do thoroughly review the evidence, review the information, and take a balanced view on the merits of, of proceeding. But as with any um, contested litigation, there's always a, a risk. There's a risk that you may lose. Um, and and it, sometimes it's, it's it, in order to take it forward, we, we're satisfied that it's a, a risk that's worth taking for the organization. Thank you. Uh, any other question? I don't see any other question. Um, so we're going to wrap up this one there. Just want to say, put on record our appreciation for the collaborative working, um, not just with HR, but across directorate as well. Um, one thing I'd like to uh, ask for to be um, presented at the next meeting. I think a previous panel had requested it. I know it was back in May, and the survey is still out for, it has been reopened. So a breakdown of the survey response, if possible, um, that would be really good. And I think Joe had, you had recommended a change to the uh, wording. Uh, if you could just clarify. Just yeah, that was, that was very specific on page 54, where it was about increasing the use of technology and just making sure it was the effective and appropriate use of technology. I think I had another word, but they're all the same, that, that kind of thing. Uh, are you happy to make that change? Is, is that? Yeah, yes, Chair. Okay. Yeah. So those are the two bits. I uh, just want to say thank you again for your time. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank always you. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have a good evening. We're just going to into the item number six, which is the HR, so human resources update, and it will be presented by uh, Stephanie Mills, head of HR, uh, Ian Tasker, Assistant Chief Exec, and I believe, um, were we expecting a third person? Oh, that's it. That's it. I think it's just the two of us tonight, Chair. Okay. If members are happy, I'll just go straight to us, um, Stephanie, and to uh, present the report, and then we will go into questions like we've done for the first item. Yeah? Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you for having us this evening. Um, so this report provides the committee with the HR update for the period 23-24. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that this report follows a new and revised format compared to previous updates reports that have been brought to this panel. The intention is to better align the HR reporting activity to the ambitions of the Council's workforce strategy and how the investment in our workforce will support the delivery 
delivery of our Greenwich plan. Um, so just going into the introduction for the report, our Greenwich plan obviously details the council's ambitions over the next four years. People plan is clearly central to the delivery of the innovation of services to residents. So the emerging workforce strategy will provide the framework for how we develop our workforce to meet those ambitions with very specific focus on the delivery of the Greenwich plan and the medium term financial strategy. Um, so this report will provide the annual overview of the key workforce metrics comparing previous years. Um, it's probably worth noting that throughout the report and the appendices, where possible, the benchmarking figures that are available for the other 33 London boroughs are provided um, essentially as a kind of reference point. So just kind of going through some headlines before I open up generally to questions. Um, during the period 23-24 and into this current year as well, HR have undertaken consultation with senior management and wider stakeholder groups to develop the workforce strategy. I think it's probably worth mentioning that it's still technically in its draft form, but essentially is going through its final consultative cycle. So I think just in reference back to the last um, update that was provided, the principles of that strategy, given the extent of the engagement, are already being embedded in terms of the work programmes and the alignments with directorates. So HR are working very closely with all of the directorates on the development of their own workforce strategies bearing in mind the very difficult climates that we're working in across the piece and again some of those referenced in this report and some we've, we've heard reflected back from legal services colleagues. Um, I think without sort of going into too much of the detail around that because I think it's probably um, something that the panel will want to go into the details with the questions on. The strategy will underpin the key HR activity including the future of work, um, something else that's been referenced previously at this panel EDI more generally in, in its wider sense and also the MTFS. So I think just in introducing the sort of framework of the report, um, essentially it's been presented under each of the five pillars of the draft workforce strategy. Now we've done that looking at a theme of five to align the strategy to the staff values whilst also reflecting the key areas of action that as an organisation we know we really need to focus on in the workforce space more generally over the next four years. So the headings that the report is presented under are attracting and recruiting talented people, strengthening our diverse and inclusive workforce, supporting and developing our people, promoting wellbeing for everyone and leading and delivering change. Um, I think that's probably, hopefully, a helpful sort of overview in terms of introducing the report. I can go through some of the headlines under each of those headings in the report, but working on the assumption that the committee will have reviewed the report and I'm sure we'll have questions, I'm happy to pause there and open up the floor. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, have members got any questions? Uh, not yet, so whilst they're thinking... Oh, you, Joe. Okay, I'll come back in. So, Joe. Thank you very much for this. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a really helpful report. Um, there are a couple of issues you talk about, about culture, which obviously is always the most difficult thing to work on. Um, and, you know, it, we're doing... We're doing good. <laughs> and. <laughs> and I'm looking at some of the examples, for instance, about um, rewarding and encouraging the workforce. And I'm just very slightly concerned that most of it seems very top down. Now, the council is a very bureaucratic organisation, and I'm not surprised. Um, but I don't see at the moment here, and I'm sure it is actually happening, sort of reference to sort of like really bringing out ideas from staff at every level and implementing them in the workplace. Um, I think you've heard me say this one before, Stephanie, but um, I just think it's such a, a, a cultural marker if you can do that and it can be seen to be done. I'm sure it is happening, but... I'd, I'd love to see it sort of spelt out as B 
being something that we're working towards that, to help with that. Um, another one on the culture, and I don't think that you alone can do this, but I just want to put on record somewhere there needs to be a culture of working across departments and not stopping because the, the question you've been asked, the task you've been given, can't be done in... Again, this, this isn't about... This, this is about developing staff to think in those ways and to sort of talk to people in other departments and, and directorates if, if an issue that they're trying to deal with goes to that. Um, and I'd, I'd just love to see that somewhere as, as being one of the aims, one of the targets you're trying to bring out, because I do think that the council as a whole will work better if that was the norm and the expectation. And I think we've all, we've all had examples of where things have stopped dead because it's not, and, and, and that is about workforce development. And that leads into um, staff engagement, et cetera, because all those, all those things, I think staff feel empowered by that, that, that approach. <clears throat> um, I think I had one other general point, but I'll shut up for a bit. Thank you. <laughs> Shall I choose Ian? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, I was going to pick up the middle one about uh, working across the council because that's, um, as you uh, quite rightly said, that's not something that HR can just do on its own. And in my sort of wider role, I've, I probably can help and answer that one a little bit more. I think if you look at the how the council's organised, it is organised in quite a silo base, which in itself can lead to that. And one of the ways that, uh, as a council, we're looking to try and address that, if you actually look at the... If, when you look at our Greenwich, our Greenwich is not based in that silo way. It's actually based in a much more cross-cutting way. It's a deliberate uh, approach that actually helps to break down silo working because it means that departments have to look at things in a, a slightly wider way. So... Uh, that is a structured intention, uh, but uh, it has to be more than that because you can structure an intention, but that, how do you actually change the culture, is something uh, far greater. So, again, uh, there is um, uh, one of the uh, other teams, uh, Change and Improvement, is very much uh, part of uh, almost what I would call an energy driver to help work across and that but also at GMT which I sit on um, it is uh, trying to uh, almost like get a much more collaborative, collaborative approach and you can look at um, also the contribution of the digital team in terms of how they work so if we take something like recently the uh, temporary accommodation that was a really good ex of how the council has approached to that, it's a really good example of how bringing together uh, DREZ and uh, the properties uh, with uh, the housing staff, with the digital staff, it, looking at uh, working together in that way and looking at it as a council problem of solving uh, temporary accommodation, not a housing problem. And it's, it's actually recognising and realising that. I, I could probably... Uh, I've known to talk quite a bit. Uh, I could probably talk a lot more about those examples, but it is something that's really embedded within uh, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, I'll pass back to Steph from maybe the more HR perspective of that, Joe. Thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, I mean, I, and I guess just sort of coming back to your sort of first point around the sort of reward, the recognition element. Um, of, of sort of the report, I mean, I, I think it's probably really important to say that this is also a really fundamental focus of the staff engagement survey that was completed earlier this year as well. So we, the results of that um, actually were really good and really encouraging in some areas, but actually identif 
identified three key areas where we know we do need to improve and interestingly improving that culture of, of voice and psychological safety and the cohesion and then sort of moving into the development piece are three key areas that we know we need to, to focus in on so in terms of looking at the priorities for the HR portfolio and the alignment with the workforce strategy we're really clear that it has to bring in the feedback from the staff survey and work has already started essentially to develop a draft action plan which will look at how we start to plug some of the gaps attached to the areas of underperformance shall we say with some support from um, expertise within the LGA for example we know that, that this is something we need to do we need to be able to do it as quickly as we reasonably can but drawing on the right expertise and that's also about brainstorming suggestions and ideas how do we bring the workforce on that journey because it can be some really simple things I think a lot of the time um, you know that the sort of recognition and the rewards I think sometimes there's a perception that there has to be a financial value attached to that whereas actually it can be something as um, as, as, you know, sort of straightforward as a, an acknowledgement, a thanks from your senior colleagues and peers, but goes a really long way in terms of looking at the morale more generally. And, and when we sort of think about engagement and how that feeds into things like recruitment and retention and other really difficult areas, um, you can start to see how the alignment of all of these things fits together. So it's very much a piece of work that is already in train. Um, we have had some really positive workshops with directorates already to look at the staff survey results from their particular areas which has started to inform local plans about things that can be done again quite quickly to address some of those areas with staff again with a much wider focus on the corporate piece so still a lot of work to do and a long way to go um, but yes very much in train so i hope that does answer that element of the question as well Thank you. Steph, I'm going to push a bit politely on the workforce strategy because that's taken far too long. Um, so I don't know, you said it's a, you know individual directorate, they have their own bit to deliver. Where is the bottleneck? What's the hold up? When is the deadline? Because I think the last time when you came here, it was in its draft form. It's been a while in its draft form. Um, things will change. By the time you have the final version, you'll need to do, you know, revise that strategy. So when is the deadline? What's the hold up? What are you doing to get this in place? Yes, thank you, Chair. It's a really, really fair pushback. So there have been lots of factors which have fed into the bottleneck in, in terms of the time frames for presenting a final version of that document. Um, there have been some local internal issues. Um, I think probably most notable has been the, the handover of the HR service from directorates, which has brought with it its own sort of time drags and delays whilst the service has had to embed into um, other service areas that can't be helped. Um, I think with the MTFS and the expedition of some of the really difficult financial challenges, it's ultimately moved a lot of the goalposts as well. So when we look back over the last 18 months in terms of when we'd started to develop the strategy and what the areas for priority were at that time, um, the goalposts have moved quite significantly. So we undertook quite an extensive period of consultation on an original draft um, towards the end of last year. Really, really helpful in terms of the feedback, but it did inevitably take a pause whilst the council responded at pace to some of the financial difficulties that it was presented with. Now, that did result in a time delay, but it also meant that we had to refresh the document. I think the positive news is that that refresh has happened. I think we are much more comfortable now that the corporate draft better reflects the accuracy of the challenges of the council aligned with its corporate plan. That has initially had a run through with GMT who are happy in principle with the direction of travel that that has taken. It is very much in its final stages in terms of moving through its uh, decision and approval making um, cycle. So I, I would certainly expect chair that there would be no reason why that document wouldn't be live by the end of this year. Thank you. We'll have that conversation again in December. Uh, Cappy. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the agency worker spend, which is obviously quite high, although the number hasn't gone up. Can you just tell us if there's any particular areas within 
council work that tend to need more agency staff than other areas? Uh, yes, so I didn't bring the breakdowns by directorate with me, um, but they are there. There are some very clear front runners in terms of where some of that supply um, is most demanded. Unsurprisingly, very high proportions in adult social care um, and children's services. Also, I think, again, because of some of the, the challenges that were reflected in the last update, DREZ is another area where we have very, very a very challenging labour market, essentially, in terms of being able to recruit and retain skilled professionals to undertake roles um, that we, we just can't secure within the market, which are drivers for increased agency spend in those areas. Now, obviously, agency spend continues to be a challenge for the organisation. Um, there are lots of planned initiatives as well as initiatives underway to start to look at how we can deal with some of those issues. Um, Azuka and Emma in the last briefing spoke to some of the intervention that is already working with some success in legal services. That's very much reflective of the type of approach that's being taken with HR support in other directorates where spend is high. So one of our immediate areas of focus is to look at strategic resourcing capacity to work with directorates where spend is particularly high, to look at things like creative recruitment strategy, but also what are the drivers um, of skills shortage and how can we look to do things like grow our own talent, what things are available within our gifts to look at how we better compete with the market. Um, but yeah, I think it's fair to say that children's and adult services continues to be um, our front runners. Thank you, Cathy. Appendix uh, 4E, there's a table, um, but I'll bring you back in. You've got a follow-up question. Well, it's a completely separate question. Is that all right? I just uh, tail off on the uh, agency then. So um, Appendix 4E, it has the breakdown of agency. Um, what stand out for me is the agency's um, over 24 months agency staff. Uh, 24 months, that's a long time to have agency staff. I think this was probably asked at previous meeting in terms of what are we doing. Uh, so I just want to ask again, um, what's our action plan uh, to reduce or uh, whether it's they need to be uh, permanent staff, what's our plan for those staff who are on agency for over two years? Thank you, Chair. Um, I may bring Ian in on some of this as well, but I think it's probably worth saying that there is certainly much tighter scrutiny and control, including oversight of all resourcing kind of decisions at the moment. Um, agency spend is not uh, immune to that scrutiny. So there is much greater oversight at a very senior level of some of the ongoing requests that are coming in from directorates, particularly where these thresholds have been met. Um, part of the dedicated sort of review and support that will come with the strategic resource is to look at what are the drivers for extensive agency supply engagement. I mean, I think we've probably discussed openly before that there will always be a need for some contingent workforce. And if it's well controlled, actually it serves as a very specific purpose. Um, but there are absolutely reasonable questions to be answered in terms of why an assignment would be ongoing for such a long period of time. Now, again, some of that is driven by difficulties attracting, recruiting, retaining the level of skill needed into particular roles, which might be a driver for extended engagement um, in, on an interim basis. But there will be others where perhaps there needs to be some discussion or consideration about other intervention that directorates and hiring managers should be considering. And certainly those conversations are happening um, with the relevant people within the HR service. But our hope is that the tightened controls in terms of the recruitment oversights will start to shine a light on some of these areas with the right questions being asked in the right places to support the intervention that's needed to bring those numbers down. So I, I think I'll just end, Chair, by saying I think we, we keep this under very close review. This is an area that we know is going to intensify in terms of the work programme for HR over the next 12 months very much kind of supported by the work that's happening more corporately around this as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything more you wanted to add on that. 
I think uh, Steph's touched upon some bits, but I think uh, what uh, one of the under underlying problems uh, can often be the actual marketplace. Uh, and uh, there is um, how uh, local authority jobs get evaluated can be a challenge that they can sometimes be actually quite differential from the, the real marketplace. Um, uh, there are a number of ways you can actually uh, look at that. Mm -hmm. A couple of the ongoing examples is the procurement service historically has had some of the longest serving uh, agency staff. There's been a, a complete review, there has been a, uh, a relook and a, a different approach to how we have structured the procurement service and they're trying to go through now uh, the actual recruitment. Um, if that is not successful in terms of within the, the, the new structure and the grades, uh, then uh, we will look at the market supplement approach, uh, which has been quite successfully used in the uh, IT digital area uh, in terms of moving that forward. The same approach uh, is being proactively looked at in DRES, which is another really high area and difficulty to recruit. Uh, there is a restructure that is just about to go out to consultation in terms of uh, address and looking to address that and there will be further ones there. So the first part of the plan is a more proactive look at the structure itself and to see whether you can do something with a structure but then also looking at um, how uh, whether there is an inherent market uh, difference from uh, the uh, local government scheme that we use to evaluate uh, pay and, the mar and, and how we use market supplements will be a, a key part of that. Uh, yes, there is, uh, and uh, Azuka was touching upon, there is another clear area which is the um, uh, uh, procurement lawyers and uh, planning lawyers, but it's getting even wider than that. So again, we are proactively working with Azuka at the present time to how we structure that and how we can uh, look to address that. So there are some short-term fixes we're trying to look at in that area, uh, but we will have to potentially look at uh, that market supplement and, uh, approach as well. Thank you. Uh, you found what you're looking for, that's good. Um, and just before I bring Jo in, because Jo's got her hand up, um, you just touched on it, and I, there's one thing that stood out for me, is that we have been, uh, we've been talking about agency for a long time. I think when I was on the finance scrutiny panel, it seemed to be a recurring uh, conversation. Um, we've got rethinking services that we're uh, working with. We've got the budget realignment and the savings target. What stood out for me is that we've got all these um, proposals, uh, yet there seem to be a spike in the staff numbers year after year. Uh, so maybe, Steph, I don't know if that's something as well we need to keep under review. So the staff, the workforce is growing, um, and at the same time we are, uh, and, and it could be rightly so because we need to have the resource to deliver the service, but there seem to be a ask to make savings here um, and then we are recruiting. So where is the balance? Um, so maybe that's something, if, if you can comment on it, but maybe that's something that we um, need to look at in terms of as an overarching picture of the organization itself, where is there excess resource and where there's a need for uh, additional resources, there's a balance. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I think your observations are right in terms of the areas where there is growth. Um, we know certainly there is uh, there are areas where there are um, there's a particular need to, to sort of fill skills gaps essentially which aren't there in order to respond to some of the priority work of the organisation attached to the MTFS. So essentially where there is a save or, or income generation or a saving attached to that, there is certainly some investment. 
Um, we've seen an increase in the number of use of things like fixed term contracts for very similar reasons. So they are above establishment, but with a very specific purpose. I think it is, it's absolutely an area to watch. And I think looking at the figures under Appendix 4, um, so if we were looking at the comparisons for the last year, we're slightly down in terms of agency worker headcount, notwithstanding the fact that spend has increased, which I think suggests that we've got fewer agency workers but at a much higher cost, which again seems to correlate with the trend that it tends to be more expensive resource, but needed for very specific skills purposes because of the difficulties in the labour market. Um, but notwithstanding, that's obviously a very, very important point, bearing in mind the financial climate and the fact that the organisation is tasked with making quite considerable cost savings. Um, my initial reflections would be where we are seeing increase in the headcount it's to deal with immediate demands on pressures and services in some areas. So we know that there has been a spike in health and adult services, for example, over the last 12 months. But with some of that additional capacity being funded by very specific short-term um, finance streams from, from elsewhere to meet a particular demand and need. So it's an area that we will continue to focus on and, and develop, but uh, hopefully that, that does answer that question, Chair. Thank you, uh, Joel. Thank you. It's, it's, I remember my, it's my other substan substantive uh, question on all of this. Is, and again, it is to do with the recruitment. It is about answering these sort of questions. And um, it, 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 it's about flex flexible working, as you know, is one of the things that I, again, that I feel very strongly about. Um, and, you know, you, you've said the C CIPD highlight that more flexibility in how and where staff work is, you know, it's one of the drivers why people want jobs. So if we're after recruiting, we've, we've got our principles. Um, and how is that working? Are we able to be really quite flexible in offering both and or hours and or where people work, that, that level of flexibility? Are, are there any barriers, um, either through any rules we've set up about limiting that, um, which may be working against getting all the recruitment we need of the best people, or any barriers amongst managers who are perhaps not, maybe not feel confident in their ability to manage remote staff? Uh, for instance, or staff that aren't working full time, it, because those are challenges for managers. I, I get that, um, and, and there are there are ways of doing it and things that they can learn. So, how how's that going? That is a very big question, so I'm going to try my best to just sort of disaggregate that a little bit. But yeah, I mean, look, it's it's. Absolutely an area, I think I'll start by saying that the organisation recognises the benefits of and really wants to be able to tap into for all of the reasons that you've just outlined, Joe. So it is probably worth saying um, to start, we've just completed a review of the flexible working policy, the, the sort of principle of that essentially being to start to better enable some of those conversations at a local level, but bringing in um, the principles of the future of work. I think one of the barriers, if we were being really honest, in terms of managers understanding what they're able to do and how that flexibility works, is perhaps not necessarily understanding how those principles can be integrated into the working patterns of, you know, what are a, an, a, you know, an enormous amount of discrete services. We're a very, very diverse and complex organisation. So the hope, um, and so that, that's been launched and, and has been implemented literally in, only in the last couple of months, but with help um, from digital colleagues to look at where we can, um, at how we better capture some of that data in a more digitalised sort of means so that we get start to get better workforce data, quality data, that we can actually look at for things like trend analysis and how we can start to signpost interventions into areas where we know we need to develop that a little bit further. Um, one of the ambitions, and this is something I'm expecting that we will peel it, um, start to pull in as we do the review of the recruitment and selection procedure, is also to look at how we bring to life the four worker types attached to the future of work principles as well. I think there is still a little bit of nervousness and uncertainty about how some of those rules 
corresponds with uh, you know the pillars that we've kind of set ourselves under that framework which perhaps also has you know some kind of impact in terms of how well we're utilizing or promoting those opportunities to the labor market so we certainly know that there are um there are things that we can do to better communicate that to prospective um, or would-be recruits in terms of being able to really promote that. And I suppose the other thing I'll say is, and, and I think it's just touching on what you were saying earlier, Ian, about our ability to compete financially in the market. We, we know we can't do that as a, as a public sector organisation. There are lots of reasons why, and there are lots of things that we can do. Not all of them are financial. Flexibility is a key one that we do have within our gift. And I think if we can start to tap into that better, um, that will certainly be a non-financial benefit that hopefully will, will, will help us in, in some of those endeavours. Um, so it's very much on the work plan. Um, I very much expect to be able to speak to that in a lot more detail when we come back with the next update report. It's certainly, again, something that we have um, scripted in terms of management development. So there is a hybrid um, working uh, sort of training and development program, essentially, for managers that we have workforce development reserves uh, essentially put aside to be able to commission. But it's really important that we do that at the right time. Um, yeah, clearly, there is work un happening at the moment to look at the office space, and I think all of us would agree that these things are all directly linked. We want to be able to ensure that one properly complements the other, so that's something we've already commissioned a provider to do. I expect that to be something that we start to mobilise again during the course of, of the next financial year. Thank you. Any other question? Um, I've got a question in the, uh, so just looking through the appendices, um, there's what stood out for me was, I, I think I was looking at the EDI data and the demogra dem demographic breakdown. Um, if I start with appendix, appendix, appendix six, that's on the sickness, um, sickness. And I think the first point talk about sickness, the reason for the highest level of sickness being stress, uh, depression, mental health. Um, and then it goes further into, um, you know, the, the percentage. I did wonder about our DSE um, service in terms of how do we assess, I think one mentioned back pain. So it was quite detailed, which is good. But I did wonder in terms of how much support are we giving uh, with the Future of Works program, uh, are we assessing our staff at home, whether they've got the right equipment uh, to reduce the um, number of sickness absence? Not that it will work, but just making sure we've got the right measures in place. And then in terms of stress and depression, um, is that to do, what, what's the main contributor? Is it uh, to do with people not being happy in their job or is it just the workload? Thank you, Chair. So uh, starting with the DSE service, so, so health and safety sits um, under a separate sort of portfolio area to HR, but we do have very close partnership working links. Um, the health and safety team manager, along with the head of service, I am aware had undertaken a complete review of the DSE assessment and have also commissioned back in to the service um, the rollout and the management of the mandatory DSE training that all desk-based staff essentially um, need to fill out and, and, and complete. So I'm, I'm assured, I suppose from a third party perspective, that that is, is properly managed and there is a very close eye being kept on that. Um, that does also incorporate some of the home working elements. Now I think it's probably important to say that there is some very specific and robust guidance that sits alongside that for anybody that is working remotely. It's not specific to home working, which is something very different. So of course there would be a requirement for that um, assessment to have been undertaken where somebody is con contractually obliged to work from home where it's a, a remote working arrangement, of course, the same principles would apply, but there's no separate rule that governs that. So again, the DSE assessment template certainly takes account of the requirements. It's very much for individuals with the online training to, to be able to ensure that they have 
their workstation set up accordingly, wherever they are undertaking their duties from. Um, coming into the point about sickness absence, what we don't have, unfortunately, at the moment is some of the more granular data that starts to tell us about what the very specific reasons underpinning sort of workplace absence for stress and mental health related conditions are. So it's very kind of high level in terms of numbers. Um, I think it's probably worth mentioning, however, that some of the other data sources are obviously very, very important in helping to derive that picture for us. So the outcome of the staff surveys is clearly one of those things. Um, notwithstanding, we've got a very specific focus on health, staff health and wellbeing. So there is a separate draft strategy which has been developed that starts to look at those things. We, I think it's really important, essentially, that we've got a focus and an eye on staff wellbeing and development with, that hopefully will start to address all of those things where, of course, there are concerns that some of those impacts are to do with work-related issues, frankly. Um, so I, th I think, again, you know, it's, it's, we, we are consistent in terms of the numbers of, of absence related to stress and mental health related conditions when we look at Pan London. Um, but I think importantly, we need to look at the sorts of interventions and things that we can put in place, which we know have an impact on staff's mental health and therefore by default contribute to some of the absence levels that we are seeing. Um, but I don't have that more granular detail. Very happy to take that away as a query and see if we can put some more meat on those bones, if that would be helpful, Chair. Um, sorry, I'm coming back again for granular detail. So on the uh, disciplinary and grievance cases, um, if I put my previous hats on where I sit on previous scrutiny, the report was actually quite detailed in terms of, um, you know, the ethnicity of those who have um, been, uh, you know, the, of the individual case, of the cases, so number of cases and um, the ethnicity. Do we have that level of detail? Uh, still, do we collect that information? Is that something that can be, uh, just in the table format, is that something that can be, um, uh, re that we can request uh, to be maybe presented at the next meeting as an appendix? Absolutely, Chair, is the answer to that. So we, we now have a rather succinct set of EDI dashboards, which absolutely break down some of the key workforce metrics by ethnicity breakdown, including employee relations casework. It's not included in this report. It is publicly available, available in the sense that it's available on the intranet site. I'm certainly happy to provide that and ensure that that's brought to this panel in future with this report. Anyone else? Um, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> And then, uh, yes, there was uh, the uh, overview and scrutiny where the equal equalities, and, equalities and Equity Action Plan was presented. I was actually surprised because I, I thought, or to me it made sense that that piece of work would sit with HR, so I could be wrong. Uh, so is that a service that sits with you? If it's not, does it fit better into your directorate? And if how you work in, um, in terms of how much have you contributed to, to this um, plan? Because one of the things which I think in, you need to keep a close eye on is uh, the makeup of our workforce. And I think the higher tier need to be better reflected in terms of um, diversity and inclusion. So I just want to know um, if you're including in that piece and... Um, what are you doing to um, improve the workforce? Sorry, Chair, I'll take that one. Uh, because one of my roles is to look at where uh, there are restructures that go across departments. Uh, in terms of mindful, this is a public forum. Um, I'm currently, one of the areas I'm looking at covers how some of that relationship actually happens. Uh, so there, it, there is a, a look at it. So yes, there is uh, a number of touch points in the council. Uh, HR is a very important one. Uh, public health has quite a uh, contact and involvement in that as well, as does, uh, uh, there's a team in uh, central uh, 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 communities environment and central. And we have a GMT member 
who has an overarching responsibility. So as part of what I'm doing, we are looking at that sort of current arrangements and trying to uh, find, uh, 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 keeping in mind the question that you are asking there. So it is a current live question, which I can't go into too much more detail at the moment for reasons of confidentiality. Completely understand and uh, thank you actually for, it's good to know that there's work going on behind the scene. Uh, I will say no more on that matter. Um, and then my last question, if uh, members had, uh, have no other question, is on the um, employment tribunals. Um, what two paragraph for me was not enough in this report. I felt we uh, could have said a bit more. Um, it's going to be one of my requests. I don't know if this is possible, so you let me know if this is possible. So we've had, the cases seem to be um, run about the same number of cases. We had 12 um, in previously pr prior year, and then we've got 11 cases. But a breakdown of the case in terms of um, like similar information you might have on the dashboard. Um, and a little bit further on the, um, the 11 cases, the, the type of claims and maybe some lessons learned and importantly, cost implication. And the reason I bring this up, I think uh, Councillor Astley mentioned earlier when, we ha when I put a similar question to um, Azuka in terms of some cases, do we think they sh we c should go ahead or is it better having some more robust discussion to avoid um, it being a tribunal case? So, yeah. It's also the cost and the number of years those tribunals can actually go on for, which is quite costly. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll pick up on that very briefly, Chair. So, yeah, I mean, I think the, the first, to answer the first point of your question, absolutely, I think it's fine for us to look at what information we can bring back to this panel in future with it that provides that level of detail. Thinking through some of the key points that you've just asked there in question, I think they're really, really helpful. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really complex area, isn't it? I think for, for lots of different reasons and, and, you know, sometimes the headlines don't necessarily give you all of the detail and the context of, of exactly what sits behind that. Um, there is absolutely a value for money argument, I think, that sits behind some of the principles of the claims that come forward as well. Um, as a principles element, you know, sometimes I think, and, and Azuka is absolutely right, I think I would just second that we have a very, very close partnership working arrangement with legal services. So I meet personally with um, the assistant heads for legal services, which look after um, employment law. We go through the cases that are currently going through the tribunal system, which affects the council directly. Um, whilst we don't sort of essentially assess the merits because that's what we would be expecting our legal counsel to do what we will do is consider that advice and whether there is a value for money argument or whether actually on a principal element this is something we should go forward so nine times out of ten i think that sort of common sense approach is is very much uh, helping us to achieve the outcome that is in the council's best interests in those circumstances um but i think there is a wider issue here as well which is Whilst the number of employment tribunal cases are generally consistent, I think there is still a feeling of needing to look at and understand the reasons why people feel the need to bring an employment tribunal claim in the first place. Um, it's something that's brought out in the appendices, which is essentially around the numbers of employee relations cases that the team are dealing with at the moment. It's always consistently high. Um, but again, I think taking into account things like the staff survey results and trying to understand what the level of morale um, engagement more generally across the organisation is, it really helps us to start to inform how much of that is playing into what we then see as being industrial unrest and if there's a disengagement or distrust of the organisation, how much of that then contributes to individuals feeling the need to take their claims to an employment tribunal. So there's a big piece of work that's sort of sitting around this more generally at the moment, as well as looking at, you know, internally at how we can help to mitigate some of that risk to the council. We were talking in the report about the establishment of the investigating officer report, for example, which is very much about helping to streamline 
um, ER outcomes, uh, getting a good result, which, you know, in my view is the starting point for managing fundamental risk to the council timely, but also simultaneously upskilling managers to be able to better manage employee relations issues with their workforce across the organisation more generally. Um, but that's, again, just a bit of context around some of the work that's happening at the moment or is planned. But absolutely, Chair, we can bring back a more thorough overview of employment tribunal claims in this report in future. Thank you. Uh, I see no other uh, questions. So just to recap on some of the uh, requests that were, because as a panel, as you know, we now have, um, we can now make recommendations. So um, there were quite a few request myself and Billy, I believe, um, Cathy, on uh, keeping an eye on the agency spend, keeping that on the review. Um, uh, Ian has already said that he's doing a piece of work, you know, looking across the whole organisation, so that's fine. So if we could have just an update on the agency, um, that would be good. And then some further details that maybe can be pulled from the EDI dashboard on maybe um, on the specifically around disciplinary grievance um, and a more thorough uh, breakdown of the tribunal cases so that we can um, look at the lessons learned. Um, and Joe has got something else to add. Well, I just wonder whether some of the things I said about making more explicit the ways that the that culture change is going to happen and about um, the explicitness of the uh, encouraging the flexibility as part of the recruitment strategy. I'm wondering whether those could be quite specific recommendations. That's uh, doable, Stephanie? Yes, yeah, absolutely. We can certainly look at how we bring those through more clearly. Yeah, that's really helpful. Fantastic. That's it. No more questions, no more comments. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Uh, item number seven, the Commission of Future Reports. Um, and this is to note the work um, which are, the reports will, will be coming to our January meeting. Um, so if I just be with me, specifically. Sorry, trying to find the list list of items coming to the January meeting. I've got a list. Uh, lovely. Thank you. So at the next meeting, we've got the finance operations report. Um, we'll be receiving an update on the financial operations um, and performance, the revenue and corporate debt management performance, advice and the benefit performance, um, including the impact on, uh, of universal credit. Is there anything else that members would like to add to that list, bearing in mind that the uh, overview and scrutiny already received like a tracker for um, this, the uh, budget spend? So um, we will have another cabinet member update. Um, I wonder, because last time we had a cabinet member update from uh, Councillor Highland, I'm wondering if we could get an update from the leader on the community engagement. Yeah? Is that okay? And the last bit of... Just making sure it's the last one. Oh, no. We've got the Freedom of Information Monitoring Report that will be coming as well. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Anything else? Anything members want to add? Any specific... Uh, areas that you want to be included in the report? No? That's it? Thank you. I think that concludes our meeting. Thank you very much for your time.